Hello, horror files. You're listening to Dissecting Horror, examining the anatomy of fear in film, television, and literature. I'm filmmaker Stephen Aguilera. I'm writer and performer Kelsey Zukowski. In this episode, we'll examine Smile, directed by Parker Finn and starring Sosie Bacon. This dissection is being presented in two episodes. This first talk will be spoiler free. We are the Horror Whispers, your champions of horror and keepers of the fearscape on this podcast of frightsome delights, if you will. I will. And we hope you will join us too, won't you? After witnessing a bizarre traumatic incident involving a patient, Dr. Rose Cotter experiences frightening occurrences she can't explain. As an overwhelming terror takes over her life, Rose must confront her troubling past and escape her horrifying new reality, according to Paramount Pictures. Smile was definitely one of the bigger hits on the horror circuit this year, so it definitely seemed like it was worth taking a look at. For a $17 million budget, it ended up making about $210 million, with two weekends in a row really dominating at the box office. I'm always happy for wins for horror like this, especially when it's not something that's like an ongoing franchise, where it's something new and a little fresher, and especially when there's like some substance that pretty much says moviegoers want horror, and they want horror with some depth to it. Written and directed by Parker Finn, Smile is inspired by an earlier short film of his called Laura Hasn't Slept from 2019. That short starred Caitlin Stacy who we see smiling in all the posters, trailers, and promotional materials for Smile. She has a very small role at the start of Smile, but is not the main character. Still, she does embody that creepy grin the best, I feel, and her scene was perhaps my favorite in the film. Yeah, she was pretty incredible. Um, Even just just the amount of hysterics and she just really makes it believable like even when no one else in the room is seeing this haunting figure and she just has so many subtle but powerful moments of someone whose mind is just being totally invaded and knows that death is looming over her Uh, I'm actually I didn't even realize who it was at the time but I had watched a period piece show that she was in um, years ago called Rain. Um, and then I uh, Fear, Inc. was a horror, really good horror film that kind of went under the radar that she was in, too. In the short, she plays a version of essentially the first scene in Smile. And I thought, I don't know how much of this is skill and how much was just pure chance, but the, mm-hmm. the quality of her scream was just yeah. so chilling. It hit that butter zone of just being scary without being nerve grating or piercing uh, Yeah, I know ears. you don't like your shrill women uh, screaming in horror films. But, no, I uh, agree. Her like, I mean, everything, just her her freaking out, even almost her hesitancy and just like, I don't know, you could almost see the wheels turning of what was going on mentally in her mind as she's just so desperate and losing it, but giving it sort of like one last chance of reaching out. And yeah, just falling back and hearing that scream. I was I was like, man, who is this girl? And then later I'm like, oh, yes, I know this girl. She's great. <laughs> but it's cool to see her uh, in another film. And I didn't realize she was in the short. So that's a cool kind of connection. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought Smile was a very strong first feature film um, from Parker Finn, the writer-director. It definitely has a good first entry in a cinematic horror sphere. Just reading into him a little bit, it seemed uh, like he, he set out with this film to make a horror film that dealt with human struggle without losing sight of traditional horror, such as the jump scares, that dread and suspense, some brutality. And I think he does that well, and I appreciate his focus for both. Smile introduces and acknowledges metaphors and deeper pain of the flaws and curse of human trauma while not losing sight of the thrill and terror that a simple horror film can bring. Especially as things escalate in the last act, you see the mark of a horror fan honoring the gritty, gory, nightmare aspects of the genre while adding a bit more substance, vulnerability. I think it still kind of gives the two camps of horror fans a little something, those that kind of prefer the art house horror and those that just kind of crave the good old gory fun and sinister escapism. I will say, as a side note, on IMDb, I counted 218 titles with the exact same name of Smile, mostly short films and um, TV episodes, but 20 were listed as actual feature films. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't even count 
titles like The Smile or Smile mm-hmm. Explanation Point. It's funny that you can't copyright a title. Yeah. And as many people, like, we could make a movie called Smile mm-hmm. Tomorrow. In fact, I probably will. This is just, just an <laughs> FU. Sosie Bacon, the actual star of the film, is daughter of Kevin Bacon and uh, Kira Sedgwick. Am I saying that right? It, it's it's okay. got like a few extra G's and W's <laughs> in there that probably um, trips me. Sounds but right. I thought she conveyed a state of deterioration and angst that reminded me of Shelley Duvall in um, The Shining. I feel like I say that every time we do an episode. But <laughs> like it all comes back to The Shining. <laughs> It's true. I never know how an actor can put themselves in that position and stay that way. And I think they have Mm -hmm. to do this every day for probably six to eight weeks or even months in the case of The Shining. And in Shelley Duvall's case, she had a a breakdown, an actual mental breakdown afterwards. So I'm not sure how much is makeup. And and, uh, I, I felt like, and I'm an asshole for saying this, but towards the end of the film, she looked closer to 40 years old and she was actually 29 when they filmed this. And I was taken aback by that. And I want to chuck that up to her talent and not just um, yeah. <laughs> anything that might get me in trouble. I mean, they definitely did do a good job, of even like the redness under her eyes, you know, showing she isn't sleeping and then, um, just the toll that everything happening that is taken on her. So it definitely is a unwinding. Um, and yeah, I think she she played that role really well. There's sort of a vulnerability, but also a little bit of a fierceness um, to her. And moments she kind of reminded me of uh, Nev Campbell in uh, Scream. Mm. I don't know, just maybe just that have gone through some trauma, but still fighting this entity well I guess it wasn't really an entity but in that case you know this darkness kind of following you and hunting you this movie actually reminded me of the ring more than any others there were elements such as uh, once you're quote-unquote infected by it you have up to a week Mm -hmm. uh, to address it it wasn't as on the nose as one week specifically you could be yeah so you could succumb within four days that sort of thing it follows kind of had a similar thing where you're infected and have to spread it to someone else. Yes, that was it. You can only survive if you manage to pass it to somebody yeah. else. Even like a little bit, while it's a little different, it reminded me a little bit of like a final destination of this like inevitability of death kind of just mm-hmm. hunting you. And it's like I don't mind the familiar trope of that, but in a way that's probably the aspect I like the least. I mean, it's – it's um, definitely foreboding and creepy. And then, yeah, it gets into this morality of like, am I willing to, you know, either l- let this kill and consume me or kill, you know, someone else brutally and horrifically. But that was probably the aspect that felt almost like just not that fresh, like a little too familiar, like we've seen this again. And I liked a lot of the substance and kind of similarities of what it's like um, with someone struggling from mental health issues and no one really understanding or hearing, even people trying to help you, you know, can't really know what you're going through in a way. And so there was kind of a similarity with that where they were very alone and even well-intentioned people um, weren't, weren't hearing her or what she was really going through. Um, so there was a lot of around that premise there I think there's a lot of good things that they did that were a little bit more fresher and unique but um yeah the that premise itself almost felt like okay this again you know sort of a thing interestingly like you in the audience I'm listening to what she's saying she's listening to what I'm saying and neither of us have discussed this before we have Mm -hmm. no idea if the other one even liked this movie yet (laughs) and we're kind of discovering it and trying to catch each other's um you know, clues from each other as to um, where where they're going on this. But I have a point to make about the cinematography in that the film builds tension with long, slow pans, push-ins and zooms, or by holding the camera on something for extended periods, not unlike The Invisible Man from 2020, uh, perhaps a bit too much like that, mm. frankly. I thought it felt a bit much to the point of being pretentious or forcing some kind of stylistic sense. But I think it's valid in the end. Uh, Generally speaking, the film does take its time for better Mm -hmm. or worse. If you're 
not really into it, it's probably going to drag. But if you're curious and intrigued enough, it it works. Yeah, I mean, I definitely um, I thought the the visuals were pretty well done. Um, yeah, there was a lot of establishing slow pans, especially anytime she goes in her car. It's like yeah, the, the drone the, the comes out. Picturesque, yes. Um, almost that almost reminded me a little bit of the beginning of The Shining when they're going mm. to the Overlook. Um, and I could see that like getting to be a bit much or repetitive. I think in a lot of ways, I, I definitely saw a lot of um, similarities to other past horror films, which. I feel like was uh, the director being a fan and maybe trying to do subtle homages or maybe it was, you know, it's just the if you're inspired or, you know, there's a certain work of horror that really stuck with you. There's probably an element of that that's going to come out in what you create. This might be I might go into this more in the spoiler one, um, but especially in the last act, I got a lot of Nightmare on Elm Street vibes. Mm. I was going to actually ask you about that. Did did the movie appeal to you on some level because of your fandom for The Nightmare on Elm Street? Uh, was it just the first one you loved or do you, you love the oh, franchise? I love, well, I love them all except for that horrendous remake, which funny thing, and Kyle Gallner, who is one of um, the leads in this movie, was in the, the hor- horrible remake, but he was one of the only good things about it. Oh, which character did he play? Um, he was Joel. Um, so I'm a big fan of his, so I really liked him in this too. He's done a fair amount of horror, actually. He was um, the cop. Yes, the cop. Right. What is it? Uh, he was the yeah, Haunting in Connecticut, Jennifer's Body, The Newer Scream, and of course, Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> the remake. Ah, uh, I know he looked really familiar, and he was the guy I was meaning to look up on IMDb. Yeah. To see what he's- <laughs> I think I've been a fan of his since like I think 2005 and Veronica Mars was mm. the first I saw him in. But yeah, he's a really good actor and he's been kind of gravitating towards horror more and more, which I love to see. I mean, it wasn't really I didn't really like sense the Nightmare on Elm Street kind of comparisons until that final act. And then I'm like, oh, this is like I feel like I'm back in that Nancy Freddie um, interaction. It wasn't like where it was too much ripped out of the book where it felt like it was copying it. I think it was, um, you know, probably just like subtle, um, maybe inspiration or, you know, it could have been coincidental. But yeah, even even towards without, you know, this isn't spoilers, but even um, even the cinematography, like towards the end. Um, it definitely had a very, uh, with like the dark dimness with these kind of flecks of like moody coloring felt very similar to like, um, Freddie's boiler room and some of those, uh, some of those scenes in Elm Street. But I feel like I sensed the horror fan in, um, Parker Finn. So I feel like anything like that, and maybe it's some of those long establishing shots too, Maybe it is just him being pretentious. I don't know. But I feel like it's uh, sort of an homage to some of those atmospheric, chilling horror films of the past. Later, I'll get into cliches. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I tend to approach reviews as I would give notes on a screenplay where something might stand out that needs fixing. Mm -hmm. So I hope I don't come off as more negative just looking at the negative points. But there are parts that I think need addressing in our dissection. And um, there are no shortage of cliches in this film. My respect goes down a little bit when I see too many homages, quote unquote. I understand that. I've definitely felt like that about some horror films where, okay, this is just like this horror movie or this horror movie. And at a certain point, it's like have, do something unique, have your own vision and voice. Yeah, which isn't easy. Yeah. But at the same time, you got to find a good balance between pleasing what the audience expects to see and then doing something uh, your own. Mm-hmm. Now, a smile itself can be something quite chilling, yet it's a smile, something normally considered positive and attractive. So why should it be so off-putting? I personally found that one effective way of creating a sense of creepiness is by mixing death with life or positivity and negativity. A haunted dolly, for example, has something Mm -hmm. um, cute and toy-like, yet it's also possessed by something demonic. A haunted house is a beautiful piece of architecture, but it's also infested by ghosts and something in a state of decay. So... I think with a smile, 
you can have either someone smiling when they should not be, and that's like mm-hmm. really weird. And then even within their face, you have, let's say, the the smile as being a positive aspect, but their eyes are still dead. That creates something that feels unnerving. And generally speaking, there's just something contradictory there, which is unsettling. And I think that's the crux of the film. Obviously, they called it Smile. Right. And all the, the promotional materials contain that. But I don't know, like, where would you go with making a movie about Smile? And I don't even think that's, there is a Smile in the short film that this is based on. Mm-hmm. But it's not the crux of it. And it's more the dream aspect of it, the demon invading your dreams. That was the point of the short film. So they took something that was very creepy and ran with it. And when I saw the trailers, I thought, wow, that's really creepy. I love that. I don't know that they quite pulled it off. So did the short film have anything to do with like trauma and and mental struggles or was it just like a bad dream? It was... Uh, a woman, that same woman in a therapist's office mm-hmm. describing being haunted by a face in her dreams. And it's, I, I believe in real life too, she sees it. Yeah. And then she's having a breakdown and she keeps doing this thing which is in Smile and Rose, the main character, ends up doing it a lot throughout and that is You're not listening to me. You're not listening to me. Listen, please, please. I'm trying to tell you, trying to convince others to the point where I feel like they could have done that maybe 10 less times in the film and I would have been better off with it. But she starts that. And I think we have Rose, our lead, finding herself acting like that unstable, crazy person that she initially saw in the beginning of the film. And the short film is basically about that and looks very similar in look and feel to the Smile movie. Mm-hmm. And it's it's quite good, actually. It has some good uh, scares in it. And I think it won some award at South by Southwest. Okay. And it's because of that short, which Paramount saw, that landed this director to make this feature film based on it. The chilling smiles definitely worked for me. I don't know, it felt more than, you know, there's a lot of horror films with creepy, malicious smile, and they work and they're always good, but there was something about it here that um, it felt more like a true mask, like, you know, um, some of the the characters going through this say um, that this entity just uh, takes over other people and puts this mask and kind of it's sort of like a possession thing as well. But and the smile itself almost seems to be mocking the victim's pain, taunting them while also seeming like true delights in uh, witnessing their mental breakdown of uh, this self-inflicted pain to come. Let's get into some of the characters. Yeah. She has a fiance. And he seems very compassionate and patient in the beginning when her symptoms were at their mildest. But as she started to come apart, he became more and more detached. And this seemed a Mm -hmm. bit uncharacteristic of someone's fiance to just shut off like that. I didn't really feel a connection between them. Not sure if that comes down to the writing or casting or both. You mentioned a trope in our last podcast on Guillermo del Toro's cabinet of curiosity that's a mouthful (laughs) where the men portrayed in some of those episodes were very supportive Mm -hmm. positive characters which you don't see too much these days i think it's become more politically correct to showcase men as more bungling or in some way toxic yeah and i I felt that to be very refreshing in Mm -hmm. that series to not have that of every guy. But in this one, the fiance was actually not so supportive and seemed to fall into that trope of the non-believing, non-supportive sort of partner. Yeah. And he does like not even a moment of like, oh man, I see you're really struggling. I'm sorry what you're going through. Let's figure this out. Like even obviously it's not most... The human reaction is if someone says there's 
a dark entity hunting and cursing me, probably most people's reaction is going to be like, okay, you're going through some stuff. That's not really happening. But yeah, it was a pretty immediate, like, I think he says, I can't deal with this. <laughs> and that's, that's your fiance um, who's coming to you for help and obviously in a lot of pain. Yeah, he was definitely an example of the type of uh, male character in a situation like this. I don't like so much. Yeah, they kind of go into uh, how Rose has always had built up these walls and never really let anyone in that close, partially because of what we uh, it's kind of kind of showed in the beginning. But just, you know, her own trauma that she hasn't really dealt with and is kind of afraid to let anyone in. So it seems like she kind of addresses that later of Joel was maybe someone she was more connected to. I think her fiance was almost like the easier, safer choice. Like she didn't have to like let her guard totally down. Um, and then she, she kind of does address to that. Oh, when things are easy. Yeah, you're great. Everything's great. But when there's something a little more real or dark, you go running, which is kind of true. Even if they're showing, okay, this isn't the right guy for her. I think that's what they were going for. But it, yeah, I could see where it could seem a little out of character because at first he does seem super kind and supportive. And then he does flip a switch pretty quickly. When she does tell him that he's always quick to bail when things get heated, that I felt should have been shown and not told. Yeah. Um, there was no setup that he was that way prior to this moment. Mm -hmm. He was always, oh, here, let me hug you. Come here and, and let's just do something, um, you know, alone time or whatever it is that makes her feel better. And it just felt like that was a bit out of the blue or just kind of a, like that's the, the the person that's supposed to be the the most there for you, mm -hmm. and he drops out of the story pretty quickly. Maybe a third of the way in, you start to realize, oh, he's not really <laughs> he's not going to be around for very long, is he? Yeah. As far as a character, he just isn't that important to the story ultimately. Yeah, not really. All right, so I want to get into how these characters interact with each other in a way that is unfavorable to me. Okay. Every time she tries to elicit cooperation from anyone, they're always resistive or dismissing her. And she's constantly yelling, please, please, you're not listening to me. They all say, now you're being crazy. And then she's, I'm not crazy. And then this is because you're your mother, yada, yada, yada. That's like most of the movie. The feeling I got in the writing of it was the writer, which is also the director, Parker, uh, finding himself with characters in certain situations and then asking what what would they say or do here? And then just went with the first thing that popped in his head, which ordinarily isn't the most creative and results in dialogue that feels like I've seen it in 50 other movies. The arguments just felt so contrived. People just fly off the handle right and left for reasons that don't seem justified and feel more like a stretch for the sake of drama. Like there wasn't any real reason for exploding that way. Every time she would ask anyone a question or a little favor to do any simple task, they would always resist or question her. I would think to myself, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what information she's hoping to gain from this conversation we're about to watch, but I'm pretty sure it's going to end with someone flying off the handle and screaming the F word. Practically every other character in this film is overreacting and is overemotional. I get that conflict is very important in every scene, but this felt forced and just got on my nerves. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really feel that way. Um I mean most of the time people are freaking out. It's like something fairly extreme happened. Like the birthday party, for example, without saying anything. <laughs> we'll get into that one later, yes. That one uh, that was okay. I get that one. <laughs> Um, I, her reactions are intense and extreme, I get, because she's going through a lot and it seems like she doesn't know what's happening and she's, you know, even people trying to help her don't really understand. Um, I guess to your point, I liked, um, I think the film plays with mental perceptions well and the, just this idea of being crazy and, you know, and how easy it is to be labeled as that and what that what happens once you're labeled crazy. No one really totally takes you seriously. 
Um, but I just like how it portrayed m- mental illness being written off in some cases that once you are perceived as crazy, any validity kind of goes out the window. Anything could happen to you. So even these well-intentioned help would allow this entity coming after her to only corner her more. But for someone who's supposed to be an experienced psychiatrist, Mm -hmm. she should, if anyone, understand what crazy behavior looks like and think to not behave that same way around other people who she's trying to convince she's not crazy, especially since she was around another person who acted that way in the beginning and knew her own reaction to it. If anyone, she should be the most equipped to rationally address what's happening. She also knows that the creature feeds off of things dying in the most dramatic of ways, so she should be consciously forcing herself not to be on edge and flipping out every three fucking seconds. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I guess she she could have put on more of an act, like everything's fine and just deal with this, you know, in her own way. I get that it's all kind of, it's like her sanity is kind of dwindling. She's having these hallucinations. She is, you know, having to face that there, this is more than a hallucination. This is more than just PTSD and something she's having to cope with. It's essentially a death curse coming after her. Not just her freaking out. Everybody seems to be too overly dramatic, even... The cop, when he sees a picture of a dead body, would fall to pieces uh, over how horrific it was and had to look away and gather himself. If anyone in the story should be unfazed by a crime scene photo, it should be the police officer. And the picture wasn't even that bad. I just felt like it was too much, we better make this um, as over the top as possible, almost to sell Mm -hmm. the audience that this is a really scary thing as opposed to just putting something there that's actually going to scare us or creep us out. Mm -hmm. Okay, I could see that. I mean, it didn't really feel like that much of an overreaction. Also, he seems to be like a fairly young cop. So like how many homicides has he really dealt with? And like, we we don't know that. But um, yeah, I didn't find that moment to be over the top, but he did have a strong reaction to it. If I would have seen the following picture as being more gory than it actually was, mm-hmm. maybe that would have sold it better. But it yeah. wasn't that bad. It just wasn't just somebody dead. Um, with some blood. Yeah. (laughs) Let me just say to end off on that point, this is not a requirement, but there really is no humor or winning (laughs) on part of any of the characters to offset all the, the building tension and general misery. It's enough to actually make me question why I would even want to watch this since it's not at its core entertaining me or being especially evocative. I did, I'm not saying I hated the film, but I just felt like it was bringing me down and wasn't really contributing enough to the genre or to my imagination Mm -hmm. to justify watching it again, yet I still liked it. (laughs) Yeah, you did. We both watched it twice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I tend to like horror that's... (laughs) sometimes a total downer like a lot of the stuff I've even written is just like no comedic relief just grim character just going through utter hell and trying to find strength and a way to keep fighting honestly I liked the kind of bridge that it had between you know being something um, definitely psychological and diving into some sort of real you know real human horror it tapped into a lot of human struggle and things that a lot of people go through. And I liked that it still had that sort of primal traditional horror with, you know, eventually seeing this monster and this haunting and the atmosphere that built. So I like those two sides, but I think almost by trying to be a little bit of both, it didn't fully commit to either. And um, so, like, I actually, I really liked it overall. I think it did a lot of things really well. But even on the second viewing, I think I appreciated a little more. A lot of things hit more and worked more. But still, when I when I finished it the second time, I still was like, okay, that was good, but it wasn't great. That's not one that's really gonna affect me or stay with me. And in, in a lot of ways, it's so much 
that I like in my horror, kind of very real, relatable, digs into human trauma and, you know, ha- uses horror as a metaphor. It was atmospheric. It was creepy. It was bloody, had some, you know, had monster effects, gore. There's a lot of things I love about it. And I do appreciate where I, uh, the filmmaker was coming from in a lot of points, but it's still, it felt like it didn't explore what I think that jumping off point was, which is, I think, maybe the most interesting substance. Um, and it it just kind of didn't go there quite far enough for me. But I also know I try to judge things sometimes for the film it is and what it was seemingly trying to be. Not necessarily, not every film is going to be exactly what I want it to be, you know? And we also don't know how much control he actually had. This is his first big right. thing. And it's a Paramount picture. He could have been sidelined by notes from the higher ups that superseded his authority. And without proper clout, maybe he just lost a lot of battles and things got a bit stale because mm-hmm. of uh, just the uh, the notes he was given. I I realize that not everyone in the United States is like here in California, where basically uh, one story ranch style house runs about a million dollars in San Fernando Valley, but their home did seem somewhat, I don't know, lavish for someone who's a, a staff psychiatrist. And I don't know what the guy did. Yeah, He, he drove a nice car. He could have done something more uh, uh, lucrative, mm-hmm. but even the, the cop's apartment looked a bit too stylish and not like a place that a, a cop would come home to and live. So that, yeah, even fair. though they did a really good job, they almost did too good of a job <laughs> in these things to the point of being a distraction. Yeah. I mean, yeah, his, I did notice his apartment was pretty nice. I mean, it wasn't anything like super elaborate, but there was like, I don't know, like a brick circular window and I just a nerd. So I noticed all the bookshelves and all the books and everything. But yeah, I think especially about the cop, cause he probably, you know, cops typically don't make that much money. Um, and it's in New York, which isn't a cheap right, place. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's kind of, you know, you, even other characters comment to Rose, like, why don't you work somewhere that pays you that big doctor money? Like, obviously, she's um, prioritizing, you know, people in a really desperate state who need help and sometimes don't have insurance, you know, more than working for a more exclusive or higher end place that, you know, might pay her more. So she probably doesn't make all that much money. But yeah, I guess it's possible her fiance does. But she, yeah, her her place does look pretty elaborate. As far as my final thoughts, it started off good, but then got steadily worse for me until by the end I was, I was actually pretty checked out. I think the initial mystery was intriguing, but as we went along, I didn't see them really building upon it in a way that was satisfying to me. It dragged without really developing much, and her decisions kept getting dumber and dumber. And as it went on, I felt less intrigued and invested in what was going to happen and more annoyed and agitated with the characters. I think they could have done something very special and unique with the concept and with the cast they had, but it didn't quite peak for me. All in all, it's a classy enough film, and it looks good and has acted exceptionally well. I like where they went, but I think the foundation was a little stronger than the payoff. And overall, I did. I actually do like the ending. It was a little, you know, without saying anything, it was a little less expected, I guess. Um, But I feel like it didn't have time to kind of connect or have a meaning or further exploration attached to that. All in all, I did find it a chilling, atmospheric, nightmarish horror film really about facing your trauma and struggles head on. It has exquisite gore and creature effects and offers an equally grisly and horrifying look at a primal, mysterious, all-encompassing evil and tragic but honest depiction of the stigma on mental health and how holding that within you can be isolating and terrifying to endure. It is a wonderful blend of horror with depth that relates to very human struggles and vulnerabilities while also offering prime psychological and paranormal horror. I love and respect so much of what was done here and where I feel like Finn was uh, coming from. I really did enjoy it, but for me, it was just missing that something a little extra to connect the intellects of these two branches of horror to really hit. 
I understand Finn didn't want to go totally art house or all metaphors on this. He wanted to focus on the thrill and scares for a horror film with human relatability and struggle, but also one that didn't lose the horror and monsters. I can appreciate and respect that too, but I think it feels more like it built up this really powerful allegory without connecting or fully exploring that. Even a few lines hinting at that meaning or the core exploration or point they were really going for here from either of the characters I think really would have hit and connected it more. In some ways it seems like a missed opportunity, but for so much here is still incredibly powerful and overall did work for me. Just wasn't quite great. It gets so repetitive with her having continuous mental breakdowns and growing paranoia with things jumping out, nobody believing her. And this goes on for like three fourths of the film. What I wanted was new information and for her to be more proactive, especially in the first half where she's not really affecting the plot. She has no real goal. Instead, the plot was affecting her, which does not make for a, a good main character. We really want her to be active, not passive, but she spends the first half merely deteriorating and begging everyone to believe her, which was making her more annoying than someone I felt afraid for. Yeah, I understand that. I I mean, I did like that she gets to a point where, where she's trying to investigate and figure out what's really going on and if there's anything that she can do to try to fight this force coming against her. I think in the beginning, it's she's so hesitant to believe that this is really happening and just kind of taking it in, but I understand the repetitive nature. Now, I have a list of cliches and tropes. Oh, boy. <laughs> and the first one is, she drops the glass when startled, which smashes. This happens twice. Mm -hmm. And they kind of half acknowledge that they're playing off a trope, especially on the second one. He says, did you smash another glass? So that kind of dispelled a little bit of that, but still, I think I've seen enough of that. Um, no, I mean, I, I get that. That one definitely didn't bother me. I think like the uh, one thing it did well was focusing on this, I don't know, th this kind of whether it be hallucinations or this thing haunting her because she was, you know, going from, I guess, from reality to whatever was happening in her mind, you know, so it's almost like that noise or someone coming up behind her or whatever it was. Essentially, it's a jump scare. I feel like that w it was actually more well done than jump scares usually are, that it kind of, it startled her, it made her jump. It worked, it worked for her, but it didn't seem any, if it was happening like every scene or something like that, I guess it would have been overdone, but it, it seemed like she was like literally being pulled out of her mind back to reality and being startled and holding a glass of wine, so... At least they didn't do it in slow motion. I'll give them that. <laughs> the other jump scare cliche would be the phone rings startling us. And that happens at least three times in the film. Mm -hmm. And even there's another one if you include the home alarm. Now, you got to have a jump scare to something. So some sort of sound or yeah. some sort of action has to happen. And I'm, I, I get that. But at the same time, it, it, when it feels like, oh, God, that again, there's a certain phenomenon where you can experience a cliche and you can't necessarily put your finger on the 20 other times that you've experienced, but you still know it's a cliche. Yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know if I've said this one before, but watching the Simpsons and they do a joke and you can't quite put your finger on what they're referencing, but you still totally get the joke. It's the same kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. And I, I got that feeling once or twice or five times too many <laughs> while watching this. Now, the other jump scare that really annoyed me, this is maybe they're getting increasingly bad as I go down my list, but mm -hmm. somebody unexpectedly says hello or her name, and then she freaks out and they say, Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I hate that one. Next. So, why is that? Why do you hate that? Because I've seen it so oh, many okay. times. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm guessing she's just so tuned out in her own world that, yeah, someone's saying, like, Hey, are you hearing me? And then. Although there was Pulled one time that jump scare worked, and it's my favorite jump scare in any movie I've ever seen, mm -hmm. and it was used that exact same way too, but it was it was funny, and it was in The Innkeepers, which mm. you'll have to see, yes. and I, I won't say anything beyond that. Okay. There was in a similar jump scare where she's crossing the street, and a car screeches and honks, and it's some asshole driving, yelling at her, what are you doing? Get out of the street, you crazy, that sort of thing. He annoyed me just 
on that other level of he's just being an asshole driver. And I'm like, God, who would be that much of an asshole when he's the one who's supposed to be looking where he's going because he's driving and not her. So that bugged me on several levels. But that's probably the more forgivable one. This one goes back to what I was just saying with regards to, I'm not sure where I've picked this up, but I know I've seen it a million times. Listening to an audio recording over and over, which incidentally we didn't even know existed or that it was being recorded, and she's turning it louder and then playing it back and listening to it closely and then detecting some subtle supernatural voice or something that she didn't catch before, and it's all very chilling. I know I've seen that one, and I and I felt like, wow, this guy has seen this. It, it may have been the ring. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like something like that happened in the ring with her going through video footage of Samara or something like that. I've gone over this several times. I probably don't need to include this, but there's that annoying and frustrating trope where nobody believes her. They say, I'm not doing this right now. And she says, you're not listening to me. You're not listening over and over and over ad nauseum. I think they... They just overdid that. It it triggered me in some mm. way because each time it happened, I noticed it and it happened a lot. The last thing on my on my list of notes is the worst one. Okay. We have several scenes where horrifying things happen and she wakes up from either a bad dream or some sort of evil hallucination. They should expel anyone from the Writers Guild for using that cliche. And I get that there is a dream element Mm -hmm. to the threat. And so it would fit here, but I still disagree that this should exist. I, every time that happened, I, this one, I actually can think of a million examples where somebody wakes up in a cold sweat because what we thought was a real thing was actually just an illusion or a dream. So I hate you, Parker Finn. Oh boy. (laughs) For including that. And specifically for that one item multiple times throughout this film. Yeah, interesting. Um, I don't know. Seems like it is kind of real though, because this is it's just this demon taunting her. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you don't get to have any opinion on that one. That's okay, cool. That's just the way it is. If you'd like to join our society of grotesquerie and loathing, please subscribe and give whatever form of like or approval the platform you are on provides. Comment your wretched thoughts below, along with what you would like us to expose in future episodes. Keep our podcast suffering on by finding it in your cold, black, withered hearts to support us on Patreon. A link to our PayPal is also below for one-time donations of any amount. It It was was nice nice knowing knowing you. you. I don't think I could have sounded more bored when I said that. (laughs) Let's do it again. Okay. It was nice Nice knowing knowing you. you. It It was was nice nice knowing knowing you. you. Okay, good.